We're going to talk about a river, about some kings, and about three frogs. A river, kings, and three frogs. And you'll remember that we're in chapter 16 of Revelation, and we've already talked about the fact that Jesus has left the most holy place. Jesus has left the most holy place. The Holy Spirit has left this earth. And God the Father is exhibiting his wrath in the seven last plagues. And we've seen a plague of sores and a plague on the sea and a plague on the fountains of waters and a plague on the sun and a plague on the seat of the beast of darkness and now we're coming to the sixth plague and it says in Revelation 16 and verse 12 and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So we have here a river, and it tells us that the river's name is Euphrates, and it's a great river. So the river is a symbol, like in Revelation we have lots of symbols. So we're not looking especially at the Middle East, but we're looking at history. And there was a river, and that river supported a city. And in Revelation, remember, a city is like a woman. You can name a city Jerusalem, or you can refer to her as a woman. Or another city, it says in chapter 17, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters. That's a woman. And in verse 5, it says that woman's name is Babylon. So in chapter 17, it says Babylon sits on many waters. And of course, if you look back in history, there was a city called Babylon. And its lifeblood was a river. And that river was the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River brought life to Babylon. In South America, there was a empire there on the coast of, of Peru, the Mocha Empire, and the Incas wanted to conquer it, but they were well surrounded with walls, and they had all that they needed in the city to last for many years, but they depended on the river that flowed into it, and the Incas dried up the river and conquered that people. And if you remember in the Bible, Babylon that had that river of life, the lifeblood of that city was Euphrates, and someone came and dried it up. Do you remember that story? We can read in, in Isaiah, in chapter 41 and verse 25, it says, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come from the rising of the sun, shall... He call upon my name, and he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth the clay. So God said, I'm going to send someone to conquer Babylon. And in chapter 44, he even names the person that he's going to send. In chapter 44 of Isaiah and verse 24, it says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, and stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. And you go down to verse 26, it says, That confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited. Was in Jerusalem inhabited? No, Jerusalem had been captured and taken to Babylon, and they were captives in Babylon. But God says, I'm going to say to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Well, who would God use 
to restore Jerusalem and Judah, it says in verse 27, that saith to the deep, be dry. Oh, something's going to be made dry. The deep, the water, be made dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So that reminds us that God, before Cyrus ever came to conquer Babylon, that God had said, you're going to dry up the rivers, and I'm going to use you to do what? What was Cyrus especially called to do? After he conquered Babylon, what was his mission in life? To make a decree that God's people could return to their city, to Jerusalem, and build their temple. So God names Cyrus here, and he says, I'm going to dry up the rivers. And going on in, verse 45, in chapter 45 of Isaiah, he says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And that's exactly what Cyrus did. When Cyrus decided it was time to conquer Babylon, he used his army to dig a big trench upstream from Babylon and divert the Euphrates River over into a, like our Dead Sea here in California, a low spot. And the river went way down, and the Babylonians, they were smart. Even in the river, they had bronze gates. If they were iron gates in the river, they would have rusted, just like your wagon did when you left it out in the rain, right? But they had bronze gates, but God says, I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And the iron uh, doors were left open that night because what was happening that night? Babylon was having a giant party. Belshazzar was having a great feast. He wasn't worried about the enemy. He was in a secure city. And Cyrus, God's anointed, dried up the Euphrates River and came in and took Babylon. So in Revelation, when it talks about the river Euphrates being dried up, that's the river that supports Babylon. And who is Babylon? Well, Babylon is the combination of all false religions. So it has the pagan dragon, it has the papal power, and it has the bipolar beast all together. That's Babylon. That's false religion. And false religion is going to have her support. And waters represent, in, in the chapter 17, it tells us, represent multitudes. In 17, verse 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. What is God getting ready for? God is getting ready to deliver his people. And to deliver his people, he's going to dry up the support for false religion. Because he's going to prepare the way for what? Who's he preparing the way for? It says right there in Revelation 16. And verse 12 that we read, thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The kings of the east represent Cyrus and his army or Jesus and his army. Jesus, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit are coming to deliver his people. And there's going to be a battle. And God is drying up the river Euphrates to support for false religion. But do you think that... False religion is happy about that? No way. And Satan's not happy about that. So in verse 17, it says, in verse 13, it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So we've seen that the river 
is that which supports false religion, all the people of this world that have united under Babylon. And we've seen the kings are Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit that come to rescue his people. And now we've come to the frogs. And it says here, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. You know anything that came out of the mouth of that old serpent? The first thing you hear in the Bible, the old serpent, the devil, the dragon, out of his mouth, what did he say? Thou shalt not surely die. So you can expect that when these frogs or these spirits that are like frogs come out, they're going to say, your dead relatives can talk. Right? Right? I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast. Remember, the beast is that papal power. And it says the beast out of his mouth comes blasphemies. What would be blasphemy? The worst kind of blasphemy. Well, Jesus was accused of the worst kind of blasphemy, wasn't he? The high priest said, you make yourself to be God and you're just a man? Well, blasphemies especially is to claim to be God. And at this time, you can expect that these spirits are going to come and say, I'm Jesus. I'm here to heal. I'm here to convert. I'm here to show you that I've changed. My law has changed. No longer is it wrong to worship the sun. Now it's the day of the sun to worship. And so it says, out of the mouth of the dragon that says, you shall not surely die, and out of the mouth of the beast that says blasphemies, that claims to be God when he's not, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. What did the false prophet come say out of his mouth? Remember, the false prophet is that bipolar beast that we talked about. The bipolar beast comes, and it's like a lamb, like in its principles, of Protestantism and Republican form of government, a government without a king and a church without a pope. That beautiful country in the United States of America rose up, but it will turn and speak like what? Like a dragon. And then when it speaks like a dragon, we learned in chapter 13, and he had power in verse 15 to give life under the image of the beast, the false prophet, the bipolar beast, makes an image to the first beast that the image of the beast should both speak, that's legislate, and cause, that's enforce, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. There's a death decree that comes from this evil spirit. It raises up the whole world because it says, and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon that says you won't surely die, and out of the mouth of the beast that declares itself to be Christ, and out of the mouth of the false prophet that makes a death decree, for they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth, that's political leaders, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be a fight because... These three spirits are devils, unclean spirits. Actual Satan himself will personate Christ. Satan himself will say, your dead can speak. Satan himself and his cohorts will appear because what's happening? The river's drying up. People are beginning to see that this religion that they've always followed isn't so sure after all. So Satan comes with his last big thrust and he sends three unclean spirits like frogs to gather people to whose battle? The battle of the great day of God Almighty. This is the battle to finish and deliver God's people. Like Cyrus, Jesus is going to come to deliver his people, but Satan's going to oppose So we've seen the river is the people that support false religion. And the whole world will wonder after the beast. 
and they'll accept the mark in their forehead or in their hand. And the, the kings of the east is Jesus coming to rescue his people, but Satan sends out three unclean spirits to gather the whole world to fight against Jesus and his coming to deliver his people. And right there in verse 15, we hear a word from heaven. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. What in the world does this have to do? Oh, wait a moment. There was a death decree. God's people are facing death. And this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, remember, was facing death. Esau, his brother, who hated him, was coming with 400 armed men. And Jacob, in this time, was very troubled. And we're told that there will be Jacob's time of trouble again. And right here, when the death decree comes, and when the spirits of unclean, uh, of unclean spirits come like frogs, well, when you think of frogs, you think of Egypt, don't you? And the plagues that came there. How many kinds of frogs did they have in Egypt? Blue ones, pink ones, and yellow ones? They had two kinds of frogs in Egypt. They had frogs that God brought forth, but the musicians also brought imitation frogs forth, right? And these are imitators. They're imitating Christ's second coming. They're imitating raising the dead. They're imitating healing. And so they're working, and when all this happens, and they make a death decree, God's people are faced with death. And it's coming, and it's coming to them. And they're in a time of trouble. And they're agonizing, just like Jacob. They're agonizing over their life, and they can't think of anything that makes them worthy of being saved. And the enemy's coming around, and all they can think of is, have I any unconfessed sin? Is there anything that would prevent God from saving me? And it says, behold, I come as a thief. Who's that? Do you know that Jacob faced someone that he thought was a thief? And who was that? Jesus himself comes to rob you of your garment if possible are you covered he says behold I come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments so you were given a garment are you keeping your garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame so here we see a picture of God's people in the time of trouble well, the seven last plagues have been falling, and now we're in the sixth plague, and there's a death decree, and they are pleading for their life. And Jesus comes, and it seems like he's trying to rob them of their own clothes, of their garment of righteousness. And that should make us think about that garment that Jesus gave us, that garment of perfect, pure living that he lived on this earth. There's a song in your hymnal covered with his life. That's your only covering that you can depend on in that day, and you will want to make sure that you've sent all your sins beforehand to judgment. So in that time, it'll seem like you're wrestling with God himself. Like someone's coming to take away your garments. And you need to hold your garments fast because you can't trust in your life of scarlet. You can only trust in that life that was given you and the perfect life of Jesus. And it'll be a struggle to think, is there anything between me and Jesus? Is there any sin that I haven't confessed? So that's a time of Jacob's trouble right there in the time of the sixth plague. For it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. 
And right from there, then it says, and he gathered them. That's those evil spirits. They're gathering them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So in Hebrew, the word for mountain is Ar or Har. Armageddon. And Ar, that means mountain. And there's a word in Hebrew, Moed, that means gathering, and a word, Megiddon, that means God's place. And Satan is gathering the world because God's people are hidden in God's place. They're in the mount of the congregation. You remember in Isaiah 14, where did Satan want to sit? Isaiah 14, he says, For thou hast said in thine heart, this is God talking about Lucifer, for thou hast said in, thy heart, in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The mount of the congregation, God's place, Har Megiddon, is the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary where God's people are gathered in Christ. Remember, we saw... The 144,000 stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. And the whole world, this is the battle of Armageddon, is the whole world under the leadership of Satan and his evil angels to attack God's people. And now next time we have to look at the seventh plague and see if God will deliver his people during the time of the seventh plague. <laughs>